All right, well, welcome to Creative Mornings. If you, if you just came in off the street because you smelled quiche, um, uh, you're at a weekly uh, design-ish lecture and a breakfast event, so, uh, so I'm so glad all you guys are here. I'm Erica Hall from Mule Design, just down the street here in San Francisco. I'd like to thank everybody who makes this possible, especially Parasoma, who is so generous in letting us have their space every month. Benjamin Wynn, who makes mimosas, of which I've, I've probably had too many already this morning, uh, and gets everything together. Jenny Chu on video, uh, who allows us to uh, preserve these for people in the future and for you to watch in case you, you missed anything because you had too much mimosa. And uh, Whisk SF providing the lovely food, and Tom Carmody taking the flattering photos of everyone here. As you tweet today, I use the hashtag SFCM uh, so that uh, everybody out there will know what they're missing. And now I'll introduce uh, Mr. Jim Ray, also from Mule Design and the uh, what co-proprietor of the food blog Salt and Fat, arbiter of all things tasty, and um, a, a good person to discuss hog with. <laughs> Jim Ray, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much, Erica. That was a, a lovely introduction, I appreciate it. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I am neither Swedish nor a, uh, an actual chef. Um, however, if you've been to Creative Mornings before, you may recognize me as the guy who checks your ticket at the door. Uh, so apparently, if you do a good enough job at that, um, they just let you up here to talk about whatever you want to. Uh, I, I have to admit something right off, though. Um, as excited as I am to be here to talk with you all about something that I know we're all pretty excited about and appreciate, I'm also terrified. Uh, not just for the usual public speaking reasons, but because I'm talking about food to a bunch of San Franciscans. And when Erica asked me if I would do it, I was so excited that I immediately said yes, and then almost as quickly I used the F word. That's right, foodies. One of the things I love about the Bay Area is practically everyone here is like really into food. You know where your food comes from, and I don't just mean that it's organic. You know which farm, on which hillside, what time of day that Meyer lemon was plucked. You guys love to talk about food, you write about food, you really love to take pictures of your food, especially for some reason food someone else has prepared for you. Uh, this this two-year-old tweet from my buddy Scott Simpson uh, really does brilliantly sum up why you should stop Instagramming your lunch. <laughs> For the most part, though, this is cool, right? I mean, if the alternative is the overprocessed and undernourished stuff that passes for food out there, I'll endure a little bit of your foodiness. Um, still, despite our collective yearning for good food here, I have the suspicion that not everyone here cooks, or at least not everyone cooks as much as they would like, or dare I suggest, maybe as much as you should. Uh, see if this sounds familiar. Uh, you worked later than you wanted to again, so you had to go to the seven o'clock Pilates class, and now you're standing in front of the Byright Prepared's food counter in sheer Lululemon pants and a yoga mat strung over your shoulder, trying to decide between quinoa with beets or kale salad. <laughs> or your friends are all Snapchatting at you from the latest pop-up barbecue slash ramen joint in town. And even though you ate out the last four nights, you can't resist another. Uh, besides, the only thing you have at home is a fridge full of craft beer, artisan mayonnaise, and imported mustards. Uh, or you just decide to keep working because you checked your company chef's Twitter account, and swordfish with mango chutney is just too hard to turn down, even if you have gained 15 pounds since you started working there. Uh, you promise yourself you make up for it at the, uh, the company spin class tomorrow. There are so many reasons to skip cooking, uh, especially in the bountiful land where we live here, that I'm gonna, gonna suggest something a little bit radical. It's actually punk rock <laughs> to go home most nights and cook dinner. And here's the thing, guys. Uh, just as much as what you eat, cooking actually matters. Uh, a few years ago, a Harvard primatologist named Richard Wrangham wrote a fascinating book called Catching Fire. It's about how cooking was a pivotal development in our evolution as a species. 
And when our ancient ancestors fired up that prehistoric barbecue for the first time and started cooking meat, it allowed us to create civilization. We are human essentially because we learn how to cook. Wrangham argues it wasn't just the physical changes brought on by a more efficient diet of cooking meat and not just eating raw nuts and plants all the time. That's for you paleo people out there. Uh, the act of cooking actually led to communities and became the basis for pairing up, for creating families. Some advice for you single folks out there. Knowing how to cook will actually guarantee a date. It's part of our DNA. <laughs> and even if you don't care about human evolution or just biding your time until some post-human singularity, Cooking is important here and now. Quick show of hands, how many of you sit in front of a keyboard and screen most of your day? I know it's going to be 110%, exactly. <laughs> and how many wish that you could create something with those hands of yours uh, that didn't involve an Adobe product or debugging a compiler error? <laughs> right. When you cook, it gives you something to do with your hands that doesn't involve a smartphone. When you cook, it gets you away from your computer and your hyper-connectedness. If just for a moment, it forces you to do something primal. It forces you to do something humans have been doing for eons. And when you switch modes like that, when you disconnect, even for half an hour, it gives your brain a little bit of room. You're still thinking about that algorithm you can't crack at work or that absolutely perfect golden ratio logo that you just haven't quite been able to finish. But while you're standing there chopping onions, your brain is still solving problems in ways that you wouldn't let it while you're hunched over your MacBook. So rather than stand up here and rant about foodieism for the rest of the show, and believe me, you guys, I can do a pretty good rant, uh, let's talk about some strategies for how we become dedicated cooks. First things first, stock your larder. Now, this is a delightful turn of phrase that I've stolen from somewhere, I can't remember. And larder is one of those delightful anachronistic terms that just means your pantry, your fridge, or your freezer. The idea here is to have the staples on hand so that when you get home, you can still throw something together with just a little bit of creativity. What are those staples? Yours are going to evolve based on your particular tastes, but let me suggest a few. Olive oil, vinegar, kosher salt, paprika, all-purpose flour, sugar, mustard, garlic, the magical egg, these are building blocks. Let's say you get home with, with some greens from the bodega. And you're pretty sure that you bought the, the bottle of dressing in your fridge probably three apartments ago. So you chop up a little garlic, a teaspoon of vinegar or lemon juice, a tablespoon of olive oil, a little mustard to round it all out, whisk vigorously with a fork. That's the best vinaigrette ever. And no need to bother with a bottle full of chemicals. Build on these essentials, and you don't have to worry about hunting down every ingredient every time you're at the store. Next up, practice your mise. Uh, it seems like the French have a word for everything, doesn't it? Uh, there's a really wonderful phrase that you'll hear in professional kitchens, mise en place, which just means to put in place. Now, to me, there's, uh, there's, there's a little bit more here, though. This is the zen of, of the kitchen. This is beyond just having your ingredients chopped. It's how a cook thinks and acts and feels while they're cooking. In a very literal sense, mise en place is all about setting up to cook. It's reading the recipe all the way through and assembling your ingredients and utensils before you start cooking. It's making sure you have everything you need at hand so there's not some mad dash around the kitchen between steps. I like to think of your mise, though, also as how you personally approach the craft. Cooking is many things, but it's also work, it requires focus, and good cooks respect this and also inject a little bit of their personality. Cultivating your mise is all about respecting the craft and making it personal to you. Learn to use salt and fat. Um, spoiler here, uh, I write a blog with a buddy of mine in Portland called Salt and Fat. And uh, it's, uh, there's also a sadly defunct podcast from, uh, from the two of us. Uh, I'm, I'm actually talking about actual salt and actual fat here. The two most maligned and misunderstood ingredients in the American diet. I have this not terribly original theory about how home cooks use or rather misuse salt and fat. Uh, because we're constantly being told that they're so bad for us, that salt and fat are at the root of so many of our health problems, we're afraid of them. We don't cook with them, and when we do, we guiltily and sparingly sprinkle just enough around the edges. Consequently, our home-cooked food tastes terrible. Uh, you know why restaurant food tastes so good? 
because it's full of salt and fat. Uh, and processed and restaurant foods hit all of those triggers in your little lizard brain because they're full of chemical stand-ins for salt and fat and sugar. Now, I'm not advocating larding up every dish with a stick of butter and a handful of salt before you deep fry it Paula Dean style, y'all. What, what I'm saying is stop being afraid of the right amounts of salt and fat. The reason why processed foods have so much sodium is because they're starting with the most bland ingredients possible. They need all the salt to make them approximate real food. You guys, on the other hand, are cooking with real food. And a little salt helps accentuate the flavors. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that fat, if I can borrow a phrase, is good. Fat is right. Fat works. I promise you there is no amount of salt you can add to any dish you cook and still have it be edible that will match the amount of sodium in a processed microwave dinner. And using real butter or real olive oil is not going to spontaneously clog an artery. Your food should be flavorful. It should be balanced. It should be something you want to eat. And you can do all of that with a pinch of too much salt and honest to God fat and still make food that's vastly better than what the industrial food complex is out there turning out. Next, equipment. So I was living in Chicago when I got my first real job. My drafty one bedroom cost $700 a month, which seems kind of amazing. Uh, for the first time in my life, I had a little bit of my own money. And what was the first thing I went out and bought? It was a nine-piece Wusthof knife set. Came with a chef's knife, a slicing knife, a paring knife, a straight paring knife, a utility knife, a bread knife, shears, a honing steel, and one of those big wooden blocks to hold it all together. Cost half a month's rent. I still have that knife set, but you know how many of the knives I actually use? Two, three at most. Uh, I've lost at least one of the paring knives and uh, replaced the block with a magnetic wall mount. I know for a lot of us, and believe me guys, I am just as guilty as anyone in this room, the gear is as much a part of the experience as the food. But, uh, but let's not fetishize it. Let's commit to buying fewer but better things. Let's promise to avoid single-use gadgets. No one needs a mango pitter, an egg slicer, an epicurean pizza cutter, a bagel cutter, a garlic peeler, or really half the shit in your neighborhood surlet top. A 12-inch skillet, a sharp knife, a mixing bowl, and a spatula is halfway to a fully outfitted kitchen, and you've got money left over to go buy organic. <clears throat> if you really, really want the essentials, my pal Nevin and I put together a list at stockandlarder.com. We are totally getting rich off the affiliate fees, by the way. <clears throat> Stop watching food porn. <laughs> now, I imagine this crowd probably knows that we spend more time in this country watching people cook on television than actually cooking ourselves. But I think this actually has a, a more pernicious effect than taking us out of the kitchen and, and dumping us on the couch in the living room. I genuinely believe it makes us feel inadequate about our ability to cook. The Food Network, the third and now fourth hours of the Today Show, Gordon Ramsay, these are all carefully orchestrated affairs. There are multiple cameras and special lights, food fluffers, entire crews of union workers making sure everything is just so. And just like real porn, they're selling you an illusion of how you're supposed to cook. An illusion you couldn't possibly hope to fulfill in your own busy life. And I really do believe that when we watch hours of chefs blindly chopping away or when they pull out that perfect roast out of the oven, every single time, I have no idea how they do it, we're rewiring our brains to expect, ex expect the same in our own kitchens. So of course, we're gonna get frustrated when our own efforts don't measure up. Instead of the perfectly coiffed celebrity chefs, think of this guy when you're cooking. Chris Kimball founded Cooks Illustrated, just about as unsexy a name as you can imagine, 20 years ago, and has been doing yeoman's work of some of the best, most accessible food writing out there. He's also a huge dork, and he'll make you a better cook. Now, two of the most important ingredients in your kitchen are things that you're not going to eat. Uh, a, a pad of paper and a pen. At the very least, write things down. What worked, what didn't. Scribble in the margins of your cookbooks. Leave notes for your future self about something that needs extra attention or something you'd do different next time. If you're feeling ambitious, keep a cooking journal. Write down as ideas as they come to you. And often, they're not going to come to you while you're in the kitchen. 
So the next time you come up with some amazing improvised off-the-cuff dinner that you want to tell all your friends about, you'll at least have a shot of making it all work again. Cook less? What can I say? I contain multitudes. Uh, what I mean by cook less is not every meal needs to be a full-blown two-hour long production. Not every meal needs to be from scratch. Not every meal needs to even be all that original. One of the best ways to make sure that you can pull together a regular meal is to have things on hand. Which means easy options for those busy days when you just want to get in and order something from Postmates. I love the Postmates app, by the way. You get to watch the little guy on the bicycle come to you. Totally sweet. There are two approaches to cooking less. First, leftovers. Easiest thing you can do when you're cooking is to make twice as much. Package up what's left, slap a date on it. It's good for a week in the fridge. Then challenge yourself to use those leftovers in a different way than you did the first time. I promise you, it'll get, to get your brain working a little bit differently. I know this sounds obvious, but it was a total revelation for me, especially when I was single and coming home and spending two hours a night cooking dinner. A lot of what you cook is pretty easy to double without having to think too hard about it. It's just as easy to roast two chickens as it is to roast one, and you're heating up your kitchen in the oven already. And plan ahead. If you've got a Sunday afternoon where you're making a big casual dinner, try to put something together for later in the week, too. Future you will thank present you for being so considerate. <clears throat> the last two things I want to touch on don't deal with a kitchen uh, technique or even cooking per se, but they are no less important. We live in one of the, one of the most amazing places on Earth. Uh, we're literally surrounded by an endless bounty of food, world-class chefs and restaurants, and like-minded people who are so passionate about food. We also live in a place of extreme inequality where every day people in our own city struggle to eat, people worry about where their next meal will come from, and whether they'll have to decide between medication or breakfast. You'll pass some of these people when you leave here today. There's so many people in need here, and you're in luck because there are so many opportunities to help. Uh, the San Francisco Food Bank needs volunteers every day. Uh, right up the street in the Tenderloin, Glide Memorial feeds thousands of people a day, and they need help bagging lunches and serving meals. Uh, and believe me, I am the last guy to tell anyone to go to church. You probably just know someone who could use a hot meal and, uh, and help them through a rough time. I know it's tempting to think that if you just stay at work a little bit longer, put in a few more hours, you'll get rich, and then you can really do some good. But, and I, I mean this sincerely, that's the kind of thinking that leads to multi-million dollar elf weddings in redwood forests. <laughs> I want to challenge you to go out into your community and help any way you can. I promise when you're at the food bank breaking down literally tons of carrots and apples and potatoes or making hundreds of ham sandwiches in Glide's basement kitchen, you'll never want to waste food in your own kitchen again. And finally, find someone who makes you a better cook. Uh, we all need muses, the people who inspire us to be better than we can be on our own. A roommate, uh, your parents, a buddy, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a partner, a spouse, a neighbor, a child. Someone out there will make you a better cook. Mine's sitting on the second row. Um, I'm the lucky one who gets to go home every night and make dinner for this beautiful redhead. And um, now you need to find a reason to be better. Thank you very much, and happy cooking. Who's got questions? Yeah. So here's what I want to do with the Q&A part. If you want to ask a question, you have to tell us all what your favorite thing to cook is, what you're excited about cooking next, or um, something that you just want to completely off the wall that you want to try. So uh, with that terribly intimidating caveat, <laughs> who, who has a question? <laughs> you can forget all the rest. Yes. Yes. What are you excited about cooking next? Oh, awesome. My favorite thing. Um, so she's excited about making a pie crust with lard. The cronut. I had to look up what a cronut was because uh, all of a sudden um, everyone I follow on Twitter in New York was talking about cronuts. Does everybody here know what a cronut is? You make a croissant, you, you make the, the dough, and then you stamp a donut out of it, and then you fry it, and then you eat it. 
it sounds like the most ridiculous, decadent thing. And, um, and so when I saw it, I, I, I was immediately reminded of being six years old, and my dad, uh, on, on Saturday and Sunday mornings, would get like, you know, the, the tub of, or the tin of biscuits that you have to like bang against the kitchen counter. Um, and he would get those and like take the top off a three liter bottle of soda and, and uh, you know, squeeze you out the middle and then and make those. So I was like, Krona, we've been, I've been eating these for years. I didn't, I didn't really understand what the big deal was. But um, I don't know, it seems, it seems like I've never had one. They seem kind of awesome. Uh, they seem a little ridiculous and over the top too. So, you know, nothing wrong with that as long as, uh, as, long as it's in moderation, right? All right, cronuts. Who's next? Yes. Hi. What, are you, what are you excited about cooking? Preserved lemons. Preserved lemons, awesome. So you can use them in so many ways. Yeah, well, you know. Um, what was your biggest kitchen nightmare? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think any any time I have had to cook for a big group, it's always uh, a bit of a mess. And like you guys have done this before, right? You're just like you're probably all foodish types. Your your friends are all excited about what you cook for them and things like that. You like to have dinner parties. You like to have your friends over, and it's always a big mess because um, you, you know you, you sort of put a lot of pressure on yourself, and you want to make sure that everything comes out all right. And oftentimes. That means making something big and elaborate with a lot of things right at the end. And so your friends are all kind of out in the living room or like the other part of your, your one bedroom apartment. And, uh, and, and they're all wondering why you're like sweating your ass off in the kitchen and nobody gets to talk to you. And then you're sort of exhausted by the end of the night. Thank you. Whoa. Uh, and so, um, uh, so I, I used to do this a lot, and, and where I like I would I would get really excited. I would have friends over, and then I would put together sort of this like big elaborate presentation, and then I wouldn't get to see any of my friends. So um, I think I what I started doing was trying to figure out how I could either do a lot of things ahead of time, or just make like a really long slow braise that got to hang out in the oven for four hours, and then I pull it out. And you know what? People love long slow braises because they're delicious and they're full of all kinds of wonderful things. You take a chicken, you put a bottle of wine and a bunch of aromatics in, throw it in the oven for an hour, it comes out. Who doesn't want to eat that? It's totally awesome. So, you know, like if, if you're going to do something like that, like go enjoy your friends because life is short and we don't get to see each other enough. Yes? Um, what, are you, what are you excited about? Oxtail stew. Oxtail stew, awesome. It goes back to childhood. What I'm curious about is why do people not know how to cook? Oh. I, I grew up in Vermont, you know, I learned from my parents. We had home ec as well as wood shop. We at least knew the basics, and not just my family, people. Is it out here, or is it high tech workers, or is it foreign born males you know, <laughs> that, that don't learn to cook? You know, not even real complicated things, but to handle it for themselves. It's, it, it's, a, it's a really good question, and, and I think across the Bay, our good friend Michael Pollan is, is, is doing, doing a lot of good work trying to figure this out, too. I, I took home ec too. I wanted to um, take band, but we moved, and they wouldn't let me bring my trumpet um, to the seventh grade because apparently they had already set up all the trumpeters they needed. So I got stuck in home ec, and I really enjoyed it. I really loved it, but um, I haven't been to high school in a while, and so I, like, they're they're not teaching home ec anymore, right? Like, do, do people have kids and stuff? Like, it seems like that's just a thing that we don't teach anymore. And I think, um, I think the, the lack of sort of education, um, sort of along with the industrialization of the food process that we all know about and hate and stuff like that, but, uh, but I, th I think those are really important. I think they go hand in hand. I think that we sort of get mass marketed and sold this idea that like we can just pick something up and throw it in the microwave or pick something up on our way home or just go out to dinner for the 17th night in a row. and and like. It, 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 starts to, it starts to have an impact on our value system and, and whether or not we actually value cooking. I think, I, think, I think a lot of people out there value the desire to know how to cook and even value like putting together an elaborate meal for friends, but like going home every night and cooking dinner is friggin work and like you guys already work a lot and I mean we have to pay rent in this ridiculous city so we work all the time. and. Um, it's, it's a job and a chore. And like, you know, we don't necessarily want to do another one of those things when we get home, when we can just chill out. 
So you know, I think, I think dedicating ourselves to, to figuring out how we actually make that work is, is important for being humans. OK, yes? Um, what are you excited yeah, about cooking? Smoking meat. Smoking meat. Do you have a smoker? You live in the East Bay or something, don't you? No. <laughs> What's that? I live in Southern California. Oh, yeah. OK, so you're going to burn, burn it all down. <laughs> 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 True. Uh, my question is, uh, what is your guilty pleasure when it comes to food? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so guilty pleasures are, are interesting. Um, if you, uh, I could punt on this and say I don't believe in guilty pleasures, but um, uh, you know, occasionally um, there, uh, I just need some calories. And the thing that I love the most is, I did this the other day. I had skipped lunch and I had to take the zip car back and go get my hair cut and a million other things. And I just needed something to get me through the day. So I walked into a gas station and I bought a Snickers bar and a bottle and a Coke. And a Coke. And like, yes, I'm admitting that to you. Stone me if you must. But um, it's, uh, sometimes I just, I just sort of need the calories. So occasionally there's like one of these like super processed things that, um, you know, I just, I just got to get, uh, got to get in so that I don't fall down in the middle of the street. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Excellent. So what, what do you make in a gratin pan? That's what I got to figure out. All right. Yeah. Awesome. I guess my question is, uh, you had some excellent uh, kind of recommendations on how to get excited about cooking. I guess I'm trying to figure out, for those people that don't know how, a lot of my friends, they just want to get into it. Uh -huh. um, are there, what do you tell the people? Uh, do they learn from cookbooks or is it their online apps? Or how do you get someone actually engaged in starting that? That's a great question. I probably should have done the talk about that, huh? Sorry. Um, no, yeah, it's, it, it is a really good question. I think that um, we, we kind of live in a, in a glorious moment of, um, there's a food renaissance, obviously, that's been happening for the last 10 years that I think we're all very much the benefit, beneficiary of. There's also this like, crazy disintermediation of media that's happening where um, we don't have to go to the fancy, severe type magazines that, that um, you know, expect that we all know exactly how to put together a fantastic Moroccan feast for 12. Um, so there, there are a lot of really great apps out there. Um, I am completely blanking on what any of them are. Uh, the, the first thing that, that I tend to recommend to people is Mark Bittman's How to Cook Everything. It is um, my absolute favorite beginner cookbook. It is a cookbook that I go, I've, been, I've been cooking for a while, and it's one of those things I still go back to it at least once a week. Um, mine is all stained and notes all over the place and is terrible looking. But um, if you don't have a copy of, of Mark Bittman's book, um, and he's, he's another one of my favorite food writers. He's a food writer from the New York Times. Um, he's been writing books and, uh, and, and kind of touring around a little bit lately. Um, but he's, he's updated it a few times. There's a vegetarian version if you're, if you're a vegetarian out there. It's completely approachable. Um, it, uh, and there's an app, too. And I hate saying this because I really want to support the guy. The book is, is like $18 or whatever a cookbook costs. The app is $2. And it's literally like everything that's in the book. I haven't been able to find anything that's not in the book that's in the app. So um, get, a, get a copy of, of Bittman's How to Cook Everything if you're interested in getting started. Um, if you're interested in kind of uh, moving on to the, on to the next step, um, Harold McGee has written a couple of books about um, sort of the science of cooking. And um, it, it will really, really just sort of like expand your mind about, um, about like what is actually happening down to the, like the molecular physical protein level. Um, so look up Harold McGee. He's got a couple of good, uh, good books too that uh, are definitely worth checking out. Um, so I, I love like, books. Um, there, are, there are some apps. There's, uh, God, there's one that I kickstarted that I can't remember the name of. <laughs> no, Mike? Wait, wait, what are you excited about cooking next? Migas, awesome. How can you tell when you cross the line between caring about your food and fetishizing your food? Oh man. <laughs> that is such a great question. And I think I think it is definitely a fine line. I think um, you know, I was I was trying to find uh, some photos up here for the presentation, and it turned out I had a lot of photos of my food. I think that's maybe a, a good first step, is like, are you um, 
that the, the, the slide that I had of, of people taking pictures of their food, there's a Tumblr dedicated to that. There's probably 50 Tumblrs dedicated to pictures of people taking pictures of their food. Um, I, you know, I think that that, um, that's maybe a first good sign, is like if you start off every meal uh, after you've checked into Foursquare with taking a picture and uploading it to Instagram so you can FOMO all your friends, then I, you know, I, th I think that's maybe sort of an indication that it's time to step back a little bit. Um, I, I think the, uh, the, the, the degree to which um, we get excited about uh, the hip, cool new place in town um, and, and follow the, the SF Eater hot map and, and aren't necessarily as excited about going home and just making dinner for our loved ones is, uh, is maybe also a, pr a, a pretty good indication. I don't know, you guys probably have thoughts on this. What's, what's a good sign that we're fetishizing too much? Our, Preciousness, yeah, that's that. There you go. That'll that'll work for just about everything. Uh, what's that? Yeah, taking more pictures than meal you cook. That's that's another good one. <laughs> Excellent. Who, who, anybody else got a suggestion for why we fetishize our food too much? <laughs> exactly. Mission Chinese is totally awesome, but uh, that line can be a little ridiculous. Um, all right, who's got more questions? Yes, what are you excited about cooking? Uh, vegetables from the farmer's market. Vegetables from the farmer's market. I love the farmer's market. Everybody here goes to the farmer's market, right? All right, excellent. My question is, which oils are, are best to heat cook with? I, I understand that you should use uh, all of it at the smoky point when it mm -hmm. smokes, it, it can become toxic. Yeah. What do you recommend? This is totally awesome, and I'm going to get, get, get to be all Harold McGee up here for a second. So um, oils have these things called smoke points, and it's the degree at which uh, the, um, the oil starts to burn. Um, olive oil, despite the fact that uh, most of the recipes that you read tell you to heat up some olive oil and throw some things, things in it, it's actually a really terrible medium for that because it has a really low smoke point. Um, I like canola oil a lot. It's, it's pretty much that right combination of uh, pretty cheap and, um, and, and has a pretty high smoke point. Um, there's very few things that I'm going to uh, to heat up so high that I'm gonna I'm gonna burn my um, canola oil. So that's that's kind of my go-to when I'm cooking. I like don't get me wrong, I love olive oil, but I like it cold. I like it in my salad dressings, um, uh, or or as a finisher, right right on something that's coming out of the oven, but not necessarily because um, olive oil is freaking expensive and most of it is fake anyway. So um, you know like use use it sparingly and make sure that you like. Get California olive oil because most of the stuff that we get from Europe is fake. It's like Turkish. Um, to, I'm not even kidding about that. Read, there's a New Yorker article that explains it all. So, um, yes, oil. I feel like I had another point, but I've lost it. Yes, you had a question. I do have a question. What, wait, what are you excited about cooking? Uh, I very much just like cooking. Well, so what, <laughs> what are you excited about getting started with? What are you excited about eating next? I actually don't. I don't really like to eat that much. Okay. <laughs> That's really interesting. Okay. How do you feel about that uh, Kickstarter campaign for Spoilant, which if you're not familiar with, it's like, a, it's like a drink that has a little bit of nutrients in it so that you don't have to eat <laughs> I, I, I keep seeing it and I haven't, I've been a little busy lately and I haven't even bothered to look up what it is. So you'll have to forgive me for being a little bit ignorant about it. But. Um, First of all, I, f I feel like irony is finally dead if we're calling a thing that we're expecting actual humans to drink to be soylent. So um, <laughs> that's good. Um, but um, you know, like there, there's like that scene in the Matrix, right, where he comes out of the Matrix and he's eating the slop off of the metal plate, and it's like everything the body needs. And his buddy's like, "Well, it's not everything the body needs." Like I like <laughs> I I think that it's it's going to be tragic if we get to the point where we're just sort of you know, eating our Jetson food in a pill or we're making up our shake that has all of, you know, your recommended daily uh, allowances of vitamins and minerals. Um, you know, it's probably fine if you're like running out the door to catch the bus to work, but I, like I really do believe, and I, and I know that like it may be a little controversial or whatever, but like I really do believe that like the act of sitting down and cooking, of getting people together, of like separating yourself from all of the stuff that we have to deal with every day for even half an hour, is like so crucial. It's so important to who, who we are as human beings. So, um, like if we're if we're eating all of our meal out of a blender, then um, you know things things are not going well. 
<laughs> okay, we got one more. Um, yes, you. Um, well, what are you excited about cooking? Uh, I just finished cooking like a homemade sourdough crostini with mozzarella basil and heirloom tomatoes. That sounds awesome. We're all coming to your place for lunch. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. How do you feel about that? And how helpful are they, or is it just bad? Um, I, I, I wouldn't be able to begin to talk about like the validity of whether or not they're helpful or harmful. Um, I, I sort of personally believe there's probably a little bit of value in fasting um, occasionally for like a day or so. Um, I like the cleanses. They they seem to be sort of. Um, they seem to sort of be in, a, in, in, in kind of line with the, with the sort of people who are also scared of antibiotics and vaccinating their children and things like that. <laughs> like the, 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 the quality of thinking that, that seems to go along with that does not seem to be what I would consider to be terribly scientifically rigorous. So um, I, I do think there's value in thinking about what you eat every day. And I think there's value in cutting off some of that occasionally. So like. Maybe once a year you take a day and maybe hopefully not a day you have to go to work or run a marathon and, and you, you eat more sparingly or um, you eat very little and, and you sort of, you meditate on that and you think about what that means for your life. Um, wh whether or not, you know, once a month you're, you're drinking um, water with cayenne pepper and lemon juice is going to do any good for you. I, personally, I don't, I don't see much value in that. So I think... Uh, that's all we have. I, I really appreciate you letting me get up here and ramble at you about something that I care about a lot. And I hope you go home and cook and um, love the people that you cook for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was awesome. Yeah, maybe, maybe we should line up a speaker to talk about cleanses. That would get, that would get a crowd early in the morning, right? <laughs> All right, um, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, thanks again to Parrish Soma, Jenny Chu, Benjamin Wynn, Tom, everybody at Mule who, who does a lot of work to put this together every month, and especially uh, Mr. Jim Ray, who doesn't cook for us nearly as often as we think he should. <laughs> um, but you can read his blog at saltandfat.com, yes? Yes. Okay, saltandfat.com. Do you still make those t-shirts? Uh, there's, they're out there somewhere. Okay, yeah, maybe you can get a nice t-shirt to celebrate salt and fat. Um, I recently was hanging out with my family and cooking a meal, and I went to the mat for real maple syrup and butter. And I was so proud of that, because they got the light, like the Aunt Jemima light and the like garden fake petroleum spread or something. And I'm like, come on. I don't eat pancakes that often. We're having real uh, maple syrup. And I'm like, it's $8. And I'm like, I'll pay for it. That was my great moment. Um, so we have, a, a, coming up this summer, we have an exciting program in partnership with um, the Arts and Crafts Museum. So we'll be tweeting about that. Uh, to remind people, uh, follow us on Twitter at San Francisco underscore CM. We don't have a mailing list, and sometimes people write to me and say, hey, I signed up for the mailing list. I don't know where you're doing that. <laughs> but, um, but enjoy those Viagra ads. <laughs> Um, once again, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, please uh, tidy your area as you leave. We don't want, you know, as Jim says, cooking tidy and eating tidy is part of the joy <laughs> and part of what makes us human. So let's leave here like the homo sapiens we are. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks very much.